what I would like to uh, discuss with you is something, uh, as uh, Professor Archer has said, is uh, new, but in fact, uh, for my group, it's not so new, because it, it started with uh, prostate cancer, and uh, it was called intracrinology. So what I will do today with you is to go to uh, this kind of history and uh, what we are uh, discussing for women today in trachinology, it's not new because I knew about it. It was demonstrated in men with prostate cancer first and it's still today the treatment that blocks two sources of uh, male hormones and the first treatment shown to prolong life. And now we are going to women. We don't want to leave women behind. So but I think in women it's even more important. So intracrinology, as you can see there, is the intracellular transformation of the precursor DHEA, which is inactive by itself, into a stradiol interstone inside the cells where it is formed, acting there, inactivated there also. So it doesn't go in the blood in terms of active hormones. It goes in the blood as inactive metabolite. So that's terribly important, as we will see, for women after uh, menopause. And so I will spend uh, three or four minutes uh, at the history because it started in men in the 1980s, it has been mentioned before. And that was uh, very surprising at that time, you know. Men castrated, you added an anti-androgen to those men, and I had one who was uh, paralyzed, and then taking flutamide, one anti-androgen, he walked out of the hospital. So something important was happening. And that was the first uh, demonstration of intracrinology. And now in the 90s, uh, we started applying the same knowledge to women. So that was discovered in 1982 at the, in Quebec City. And that was the first treatment shown to prolong life. And you have the, it was also the first combination therapy approved in the world, first in Canada in 1984, and in 1989, after the Crawford study by the US NCI, the first combination approved by the US FDA of any combination of drugs. But now there are many of them. And the basis of that, still true today, is that DHEA makes androgens locally in the prostate. And what we found at that time is that after medical castration with GnRH agonists like Zolodex or Ulpran or Bicapeptil in Europe, where the testosterone comes down to 3%, if you look in the prostate, the DHT, which is the most active androgen, comes down by only 60%. So there is a very important amount of androgens left, not from the testis, because the testis has stopped completely with the GnRH agonist, but from DHEA, which is transformed locally in the prostate. And this is the uh, schematic present presentation that I uh, use at that time, you know, the pitre, LH, the testis, easy to control. I mean, you remove it by surgery, or you give a GnRH agonist, and you stop completely the secretion. But DHT stays there and continues to be transformed in the prostate into androgens. And then the first uh, anti-androgen we used was nilutamide from roussel Uclair. I mean, those old enough know about this company from uh, Paris, and then flutamide from Shering Flower, and then bicalutamide from uh, AstraZeneca. And then now, recently, enzalutamide, which is, uh, which is uh, extended and apilatamide and darinutamide, which are newer anti-androgens, but always the same, same principle. And uh, there are studies going on, you know, stampede latitude, and it's recognized now by the 
Bertrand Tombal is the president of the European Organization for Research and Treatment on Cancer. Canada is a British legacy. I'm not putting there because it's my name, but that's, it's a recognition that uh, intracranology or the intracellular formation of androgens in this case is recognized after a very long time. So this is, just to tell you, it's not uh, something unique to women, but that's something shown long time ago in men and still going on, and that's still the best treatment for prostate cancer. So we can discuss when to start and all of that, but the principle of two sources of androgens is very well demonstrated. So what do you do, what do you need for intracrinology? You need enzymes in the tissue. Enzymes that can transform the HEA coming from the adrenals, transform into series of intermediates to testosterone and then to estradiol, something like 35 enzymes. So when I st we started our group, there were two enzymes known. Now there are 35. And our group has been cloning and sequencing most of these enzymes during something like 30 years. So it did not fall from the sky. So you had to work hard on it. And then I think the enzymes is okay, but you need the precursor and the HEA. So that starts with the monkey, with the primates, and the human as you see has got the DHEA. So the combination of the two has made what we believe menopause possible and menopause without side effects. Something interesting for you to, to know is that if you take men castrated and women postmenopause, and you look at all the steroids that we have been looking at uh, very long series of, of steroids and metabolites, it's the same. So a man castrated, woman postmenopausal, that's very, very important. Everything in those persons comes from DHEA. So DHEA inactive, does look, look very important. But after menopause in women, we will see that's the only source of both estrogens and androgens made inside the cells. That's a big difference. It doesn't float everywhere in the body, but DHEA inactive goes to the cell, transformed locally, inactivated locally, and the other tissues don't know. It's like a letter to you, you know, it goes to, to you, not the others, and each tissue does what it has to do with uh, the DHEA and the sex steroids. So now we go to, to women, so the proof in men, and then what is the principle? And then we go to women. So women, there are two sources of sex steroids, both estrogens and androgens. The ovary, no, I should not say that, because estrogens, the ovary, not androgens, before menopause, but at menopause it stops. So the estrogen, estradiol, ovary, before menopause. Reproduction, pregnancy, and all these events, but at menopause, completely finished, no more in the blood. But DHEA is there before menopause. It's making estrogens and androgens in peripheral tissue, but it continues after menopause. And after menopause, that's the only source of sex steroids. Terribly important. So th that's what is shown on this slide here. And that's another representation where you see the estradiol, no more of a, after menopause. And the small amount of estradiol in the blood after menopause, it's not coming from the ovary. It's coming from inside the cell, very small leakage biologically inactive concentrations, and as well demonstrated by the endometrium, which is atrophic in all women, this, despite DHEA in the blood. So there is no enzyme in the endometrium to transform DHEA. The other tissue do have this enzyme. They make estradiol and they make testosterone for use in the cells, inactivation in the cells, and what is released in the blood is inactive. So that's terribly important, and that's what it has uh, safety implications for women after menopause. They don't have to worry about estradiol in the blood, but they have estradiol in their tissue coming from the HEA, and they have testosterone also. But nothing in the blood is active, only inactive metabolites. Something 
very important also is to, and that's essential for 15 years, I had a big group working on mass spectrometry assay for sex stories. Because in women, estradiol, the average is 1.5 picogram per ml or 2 picogram, very low. So you need validated mass spectrometry assay. Not only mass spectrometry, but validated. That means you take care of all the problems that can occur, and especially we don't use radium nurse. Because radium nurse, they give variable values which don't, are not, or may not reflect the real value. So we found something, and thanks to that, we could say what we can say today, because we could measure everything and say where the estradiol, which is in the blood, where is it coming from? And you need mass spec validator. Now I will, uh, so that gives you a good idea of what intracrinology is, what women are made of, you know, it's a very sophisticated organization, the, uh, the human species. And there are major differences, as uh, David already alluded to, between endocrinology in a way, we have been learning very much from endocrinology. I liked it very much, in fact, very important, but very simple compared to intracrinology. Endocrinology, it's, you have hormones made, let's say, the ovary, makes a stradiol, sends it to the blood, goes everywhere, and each tissue must take it as it is, and it goes to the receptor. No control from the peripheral tissue. Intracrinology, after menopause, each tissue, no more estradiol in the blood, but the HEA, and the HEA is transformed locally inside each tissue into small amount of estrogens and androgens. So you save a lot of hormones by doing that. And it is inactivated locally also. And in the blood, there is no active estradiol or testosterone terribly low, inactive, as well demonstrated by the atrophy in all the endometria of all wo normal women. So that's a huge difference. I will show you an inactivation also, which I have been repeating two or three times. That's terribly important. The human is only like that, has this capacity not only to make estrogens and androgens in peripheral tissue, but to inactivate it. And we have the glucuronyl transferase and the sulfotransferase. It's a very complex organization. And we know the estradiol can have 16 metabolites or more, and it has shown many also. So there is a very complicated, it took 500 million years to do that, you know. So that's uh, the woman, what they have in terms of control of sex hormone is a very sophisticated organization. So estradiol, as is shown on this slide, on the left, you see normal, and then after uh, postmenopause, so it comes from ET, it can be 200 or 500 picogram per ml, but it comes down to something like three or four picogram per ml after our menopause. And it should be within those limits to avoid any stimulation. And that's what intracrinology does. And uh, we have found in 2006 the up to the higher limit of normal, 9.3 picogram per ml. Recently coming from uh, Jamison and the group, 10 picogram, and the Mayo Clinic, 10 picogram in 2017. Same thing, 9.3, 10, but that's the upper limit. More than that, we don't know. So that's uh, another question. But that's our nature has been made to keep estradiol within those limits. And that's what DHEA does. And uh, I don't want you to uh, remember all of this, but just to uh, indicate the complexity of uh, intracrinology compared to endocrinology. So endocrinology, the ovary, for example, makes a stradiol, complicated, but it's a master of orchestra before menopause, so it sends that to the blood, goes to all the tissues. After menopause, finish, because the uterus, there is no permission to stimulate the uterus after menopause. Women will have hyperplasia and cancer, so you don't want that. And 
no more yesterday or in the blood. But most tissue still require hormones, sex steroids. I mean, the, the bone, we see it around, almost all, all tissue, probably including the brain, they need sex steroids. But each tissue from menopause on, they were doing it before, but we, we did not know because the stradiol from the ovary was kind of overriding the, the effects. But after menopause, as uh, Andrea knows very well, only the HA. And each tissue takes it from the blood and transform it according to the enzymes which are present in each tissue, specific of each tissue. So there is work for everybody you now in this room and others to, co to examine and understand how each tissue controls sex with formation. There's something like 30 enzymes to play with, as you can see on the right there, and that's tissue specific. And uh, so that's it. that's it. So endocrinology goes to the tissue, no control for the tissue. It has to take it as it comes. So that's why it is a problem of uh, endometrial stimulation, for example. The endometrium does not have the enzymes to make estradiol. But if estradiol were continued to be secreted by the ovary, that would stimulate the endometrium, which does not happen. It does not happen because it's DHE which takes over after uh, menopause. But DHE is very nice. I mean, uh, as we know, a very important molecule. But the problem is that it comes down with age. And it comes down starting at the age of 30 years on average. And at time of menopause, on average, it has come down by 60% and continues afterwards. So some women, as we see in the other one, so there's a large variation between different women, before menopause on the left and after on the right. But you can see it's coming down. But in some women, it's still quite high. And some women don't have problems. They have enough. But we are lucky that 20% or so don't have problems because they have lost DHE also. And estradiol has gone. But they can manage with what is left. That was the, that's the idea of uh, menopause. But the problem is the following. Uh, I mean, we are very pleased about it. Not only women, but men live longer than before. So in 1900, for example, probably the same thing in, uh, in Europe, Life expectancy was 47 years. Some women live longer, but on average. So menopause is not a big problem. But now it's 82 or 81 years. So there are many years. And every year that goes by, three months add to the life. You know? So medicine has been fantastic. But uh, DHE was left behind. And there is no feedback mechanism for DHE. It comes down, stays down. So we have to do something. It's not like the other hormones. When they come down, something simulates them. More is produced, like the heat in a room, you know. Temperature comes down, it goes up, but not for the HA. And uh, the consequence are menopausal symptoms. They are all there on this. Vulvovaginal atrophy is the one we have been looking at because we use small amount locally and exclusively local effect. Sexual dysfunction is attached to it also. That's a very interesting mechanism by your nerves in the vagina, the androgenic component of the HEA. And the rest of the symptoms, that's, that's a problem, which is not solved by giving the HEA intravaginally, by the way, because it's, it's a local effect. But the problem is exactly the same. And androgens are important in women, so as uh, I mentioned. And at time of menopause, decrease already by 60%. And sexual function in women is androgens. Androgens in women, 100% DHEA. And DHEA is coming down. So no big surprise. And uh, as I did mention, the endometrium, no concern because there is no enzyme. And we have been doing a study, and Andrea has been doing studies also. We look... Uh, ultrasound to look at it, we look at biopsy, and increasing 10 times the HE in the blood for one year, no effect on the endometrium. So yeah, the nature evolution has really protected very well the endometrium. So kind of summary, so uh, 
two sources of uh, sex to Western women before menopause over it, but it stops on menopause, no more. No more significant. But each year, whole life. Uh, but the problem is after menopause, it's low already at time menopause and continues to decrease after that. And as I mentioned, so that's very important, estrogen both over A and DHEA before menopause, but after menopause, only DHEA. It took a long time to achieve that, you know, it took something like 500 million years. I mean, the human nature is uh, quite a fantastic uh, achievement when we, when we look at it. And we look at evolution, you go from the macaque, you know, a jump on one branch to the other, to the human, big jump. And in terms of hormones also, it's a big, big, big change, sophistication. And uh, the human being is uh, something we have to be very, very uh, pleased with. And it is inactivated, as I mentioned before, in the cells. And then uh, that avoid stimulation of the uterus or other effects which are not uh, warranted. So what I wanted to, uh, to uh, discuss uh, with you and, and having your uh, input from that is that uh, sex hormones are more complicated than we thought 40 years ago. I mean, we thought the testes would do it in men, finish. And you were in women, no more. But in men, the treatment of today of prostate cancer, you have to be careful. You have to take care what is made in the peripheral tissue. And that's the basis of all the new treatments coming out today for prostate cancer. For women, uh, that's even more important than in men because in men, the testis is always there. If you don't take it out, it's there. And so the sources of sex steroids are two. And, uh, something like 40% is coming from the HEA, and the only way to look at it is to look at the metabolites, because at one point it has to come out of the organism. If you look at the metabolites, you see it. And in women, as I have shown, men castrated, and then women postmenopausal, in terms of hormones, the same. And all the sex steroids after menopause coming from the HEA. So I wanted to say that because I think that's terribly important that it should be known by all of you who took the pain, not the pain, the trouble or the pleasure of coming here. And uh, I think that's something that uh, all of us as doctors or physicians need to know. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.